everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com and what an eventful role we had to be honest. We had a massive shock appearance, we had AJ Styles versus Ricochet, and we had just two people who were just in love. Just bloody in love, isn't that lovely? Ah, but was Raw any good despite all of these eventful things happening? There's only one way to find out, and that is by assigning each individual segment a lovely individual grade. That's right, I'm your teacher, Mr. The Jobber, and this is Monday Night Raw Graded. So we open the show not just with the Universal Champion Seth Rollins, but with the Raw Women's Champion Becky Lynch as well. And did you know, actually, that they're dating? They're boyfriend and girlfriend. I would never have known that. I googled it before I came in here, and luckily it told me the truth, but I, you just could never tell from WWE's product. It, respect to them as well for not forcing it on us at all. No, WWE are very much forcing this relationship upon us. Of course they are. Um, I mean, I understand why to a degree. You've got two of your biggest stars anyway, and they just happen to start dating. It's like, well, we, we could mention this, but I feel like there's a line somewhere between acknowledging it and kind of milking it a little bit. And now, it seems like they're milking it. Fair enough. If Rollins and Becky are both totally fine with it, then that's cool. But you can't help but think that, you know, especially Becky's such a fierce and proud and strong woman because of what she's done in the ring, to kind of be reduced to a, this is my boyfriend who is also a wrestler storyline. It just, it seems a little bit like her balls have been cut off and so have Seth's as well. But I don't know, we'll see how this segment went. We'll see what was, we'll see what happened. So Rollins commends Corbin actually. He goes, you know, it was very smart that you picked Lacey Evans to be the special guest referee at Stomping Grounds because you knew that I wouldn't attack her. But what you didn't realize was that I had the best backup on the planet. My girlfriend, Becky Lynch, we're dating. Don't know if you knew this. Becky then says it pays to be the man's man. The man being Becky and the man's man being Seth Rollins, the man's, yes, S yeah. So Corbin's music hits anyway, and while both baby faces are distracted, those two baby faces are going out, by the way, uh, Lacey hits the ring from behind and attacks Becky, and then Becky gets the upper hand. Seth tries to stop her, but Becky's like, no, get out of the way, and then Seth's like, go for it, and then Becky batters Lacey Evans. While this is all going down, Corbin rushes in the ring, Seth gets the better of him, and both heels are driven to the outside. Now this was a weird bit, uh, both heels, you know, while they're being all beaten up on the outside and like, oh my god, we were just hit by a whirlwind who happens to be dating another whirlwind and it's just such a potent combination. They actually grab some microphones and cut a smug heel promo while selling the beatdown that the baby faces have just given them. What on earth was that about? Lacey's like, how about I give your man Becky another right hand, ha 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 ha. And Corbin's like, yeah, that's right, you didn't see that coming, did you? And it's like, they've just both beaten you up, both of you. So just calm down right now, it was very strange. The heels make a challenge for Extreme Rules. They say, we want you in a mixed tag match, um, Corbin and Lacey versus Seth and Becky, who are going out actually, they're dating. Um, the baby faces agree, but they say, look, if we win, you don't get any more title shots at us. And then the heels go, we agree to that as long as you put both belts on the line in this match and it's winning team takes all. Yeah! Uh, what? Don't know why Batista wasn't involved at all. He's not even part of the product really anymore. So I'm gonna give this opening segment. Oh, I feel a bit harsh doing this. A C minus, right? I'm, I'm just. I feel like it was always gonna suffer regardless of how good it actually was because of the dissatisfying, I guess, Corbin versus Rollins match at Stomping Grounds, the weak part of a show, which on the whole exceeded expectations. So yeah, that was always gonna be a, a negative factor, which wouldn't help the segment at all. Also, another negative factor was the whole idea that Becky and Seth are kind of all now being like, look at us, we're dating, we're the cool kids, and it's like, well, you are cool individually, but together it's a bit strange. And I do feel like particularly Becky Lynch's cool factor is being a little bit neutered, just especially by the, the fact that like when Rollins says a line like, I had the best backup on the planet, and Becky's reaction was very un-Becky Lynch-like. She was like, oh, shucks, like, stop it, man, Seth. I know, ugh, she's so kind. Then she, you know, got on the mic and ran down Lacey and it was all right, she regained some of her fire, but oh, there's just something about it. There's just something about it that's a little bit off. And also, of course, this gets a C- minus because of the weird ordering of things, or the weird writing, with the heels making a big sneak attack ambush on the baby faces, getting beaten down, and then going to the outside, grabbing some mics and going like, ha ha ha, we're the heels though, we're still smug. Well, you didn't get the upper hand in the slightest at all, mate, did you really? So just calm down. Next up, we had our first match of the evening, an eight-man, four-team elimination tag team 
kind of my right i'll explain right so on one side we had the new day and the usos on the other side we had both sets of tag team champions wild card daniel bryan and wild card eric rowan as well or just rowan and the revival as well so we had heels on one side baby faces on the other and basically say like jimmy uso got eliminated then jay uso would also have to leave the match it was that kind of thing Brian was, of course, still very, very over last night. They're still in Washington State, but he had a bit of a nightmare here. Uh, accidentally taking out Scott Dawson with a misplaced suicide dive, getting back in the ring, resuming his assault on the babyface teams, but then Dash Wilder didn't take too kindly to his partner being flattened by Daniel Bryan. Popped him with a little, I think it was like an uppercut or some sort of strike as Daniel Bryan hit the ropes. Bryan fell backwards and Xavier Woods rolled him up and Bryan and Rowan were out of the match pretty quickly, it has to be said. This actually risked making the Revival look a bit stupid because they're usually tactical geniuses, but it made them look a bit stupid for getting hot-headed and eliminating effectively their own tag team partners but they evened the odds in about a minute or so of that happening as they hit a really nice shatter machine on a leaping Xavier Woods and taking the new day out of the match as well so it was down to the revival versus the Usos and it was the Usos who actually picked up the victory over the reigning Raw tag team champions and they got the win in very revival fashion it has to be said I can't remember which Uso was the legal man and which one was the illegal man but basically there was a blind tag involved there was a bit of wading in position uh, the Revival hit a superplex, but then I think it might have been Jimmy Uso was on hand to hit a splash out of nowhere. He just waited for them to get into position and then hit the splash and the Usos picked up a victory and this will surely lead to a title shot down the line. So I'm going to give this a B grade, but one tinged with caution, guys. So this was a fun match. I will admit I did really enjoy it, but at the same time, it was the first example of quite a few on this show of WWE doing that weird thing that was reported last week the whole apparently Vince has got this idea now that he doesn't want wrestling during the commercial breaks because legitimate sports like MMA and stuff they don't have matches during the commercial breaks he seems to have got it a bit wrong they just don't have matches during the commercial breaks it's not that they let their matches go on through the commercial breaks but take out the wrestling from the wrestling matches that's ongoing if that makes any sort of sense at all. So basically Vince wants to keep the structure of the shows where the wrestling stretches over the course of a commercial break, but he doesn't want any wrestling in that commercial break. It's a bit of a catch-22 situation there, but they've, they've found out several ways to do it on this show, this being one of them, with the break and the action coming between, I guess, eliminations in this match. They did it last week with some two out of three fall stuff as well, and they do it several more times on this episode, and don't worry, I'll point it out to you when it happens, because you're all proper nice in that. And thanks for watching the video. Next up, Miz TV featuring R-Truth and Carmella. R-Truth, of course, carrying the 24-7 championship, which he took from Drake Maverick on his wedding day. They fired him on his wedding. They jobbed him out on his wedding day. Uh, Drake Maverick comes out after... Well, first of all, Truth talks to The Miz about how difficult it is being 24-7 champion so often. He says he can't sleep, can't go to the grocery store, says that people turn him to his house dressed as the cops. Which I was like, what? Um, okay, uh, Dre Maverick comes out and he's basically wearing the same clothes as he had on for his wedding. His tie is tied around his head like a headband. He's looking a bit worse for wear, but in a wrestler way. So he's still fake tanned and gorgeous and his hair is perfect and stuff, but... Anyway, gets in the ring uh, and demands a rematch for the championship. One-on-one -on -one with R-Truth in the middle of this very ring. He's so distraught because his wife won't go on their honeymoon with him. She won't speak to him. They haven't even consummated the marriage. R-Truth thinks he said constipated and he says fiber's good for that. And it's, it's a really, really, like, bad joke. But at the same time, if anyone can make those sort of bad jokes work, it's our truth and Drake Maverick. But yes, Drake restates the fact that he wants a one-on-one -on -one rematch because he wants to win back the love of his life. Carmella goes, oh, truth, give him a match. He just wants to win his wife back. And Drake Maverick goes, no, I don't mean my wife. I mean the 24-7 championship. And I was like, well... That is a very good line, to be fair. That didn't get as big of a pop as it deserved. They do set up the match, and R-Truth wins almost immediately with the lie detector. It's a comically short match. Then all the underclasses, I've started to call them, come out, like the Lucha House Party, Cedric Alexander, all the people who are being underused and underutilized and underappreciated on Monday Night Raw. They all come along trying to win the title from R-Truth, but he fends a few of them off, grabs Carmella, they run off to the back, and they are pursued by the crowd. And then Drake Maverick's just left in the ring despondent. Uh, I think Charlie Caruso or someone like that tries to interview him, but he just walks away. The crowd aren't sympathetic in the slightest. I was. I feel for you, Drake. Don't worry. This segment was too silly. It was too long for what it was. It had some pretty bad writing in it, and it was a total waste of The Miz this week, and I still loved it. I'm going to give it a B plus. The 24-7 stuff is honestly the funnest product or the funnest part of the main roster product at the moment, 
and it's almost entirely down to the efforts at the moment anyway of our truth and Drake Maverick but I have no doubt that there's a whole host of other superstars waiting to get their chance as well their spotlight with the title just to show their creativity and their sense of humor and to really show what they can do in a weird way this title is turning into a little bit of a saving grace for the main roster. Next up, the handicap match that was announced at Stomping Grounds. It's Roman Reigns versus both Shane McMahon and Andrew McIntyre. It's specified before the match as well that it's like a tornado handicap tag team match, if that makes any sense. There's no tags. Shane and Drew don't need to tag each other. They can just both be in the ring, battering the big dog again and again. And that's just, that is just what happened, isn't it? No, actually, to be fair, Roman started off strong, popping the crowd because he was really brave and valiant. But then eventually the numbers game caught up with him and he was beaten down by Shane and Drew for what felt like a long time. I'm honestly not certain how long it went on for. It could have been anywhere between two and 35 minutes. I don't know. Then, right, I'm sure you've heard by now, but let's just walk through it, what happened, because this was a shock. I was legitimately shocked when this happened. So we had the Claymore kick, that wasn't the shocking part. We had Shane mocking the spear and hitting a spear on Roman, that wasn't the shocking part. Shane got up on the top rope to deliver the coast to coast, and the gong hit, and the lights went down. And despite him having the saddest match in the history of wrestling just a few weeks ago, everyone screamed their lungs out because The Undertaker was in the building. Yes, the lights came back on. Shane still stood on the top rope like, what's going on? Undertaker's there. Shane sees him, jumps for him. Undertaker catches him in the chokeslam position, hoists him up, dro drops him kind of. It wasn't the cleanest chokeslam. It was a weird chokeslam, actually. It didn't really look like a botch. It looked more like he just went... Bloop. It was like a mic drop, but a it was a Shane drop. It was very strange. Drew then kind of runs in, Undertaker boots him and then gets him in the corner and starts, because he's the best pure striker in WWE. Um, yep, Undertaker clears the ring. The heels scuttle up the ramp like, oh no, I'm Drew. Uh, and Roman and Undertaker are left in the ring. And then a tag match was later announced for Extreme Rules, just straight off the bat. Undertaker and Roman Reigns against Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre. Right, so originally I had this down as an A-, minus because I was just blown away by the appearance of The Undertaker. Then I downgraded it to a B+. Plus. I'm going to downgrade it further to a B, but I'm not going any lower than that because it was genuinely exciting and a huge moment and it made Raw feel important. So it's a B, but there were faults with it, so don't worry, I'm going to break those down now. The first and most obvious fault is that Undertaker's going to wrestle again, and oh god, please don't hurt yourself. That Goldberg match was really scary and sad. But the fact that it's a tag match, I guess, is a bit of a saving grace. He can chill on the apron for a little bit, come in, play the greatest hits, as they say, and maybe get out of there, and it could all be fine. Then again, that chokeslam did not look very good, so that's not very promising. But the other thing is, this could be his choice after Saudi Arabia. This could have been him saying, no, I can't make that like my last match for a while. I've got to come back in and do another one. I'm assuming this will lead up to something at SummerSlam. Uh, I hope it's not against Shane. I hope it's against Drew, and I hope that Drew beats The Undertaker. If it's Undertaker versus Shane again, Man, well then we get on to my final reason why this segment didn't quite ring that true with me and that's because Shane, right, has been built up as like, he's, he's dished out injustice to so many people and there are so many people who deserve revenge on Shane McMahon. I mean there's Roman Reigns, there's The Miz, there's The Miz's dad, there's Heath Slater from the other week, there's the referee from Sunday night who got his knee twisted by Shane. I mean all these people deserve revenge on Shane O'Mac and the guy who gets to dish out that punishment is The Undertaker who ended him at WrestleMania 32. <laughs> so I, I don't really know what, what this is about. I'm glad to see The Undertaker back and, and has a, a chance to kind of right the wrongs of Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, I haven't got too high hopes and I hope that doesn't sound too harsh. Next up, we go from the, uh, the shock appearance of the, under like the actual Undertaker to a tug of war between Bobby Lashley and Braun Strowman. Mm. I mean, currently this is the hottest feud in WWE. They've had an arm wrestling contest, which Strowman won. They had a match in Saudi Arabia, which Strowman won. And now they've had a tug of war, which Strowman won as well. Hat trick, trifecta. What are you gonna do, Bobby Lashley, when Braun Strowman is bigger and stronger than you? What he's gonna do is beat him up with the help of the, the rope from the tug of war game. So what happened was basically, they both literally just had a tug of war in the middle of the ring. Uh, Lashley looked like he was gonna win, but Strowman was just faking him out, pretending he was about to lose and then going, no, I'm Braun Strowman, I'm absolutely huge. He pulled Bobby Lashley across the middle dividing line. Lashley used that as an opportunity to jump Strowman and blinded him with the rope from the game of the tug and war. This blinding led to, understandably, Lashley getting the upper hand in the brawl afterwards, and he stood tall at the end of the segment. But the real winner and the champion of our hearts is Braun Strowman, the resident WWE tug of war champion. 
I'm gonna give this a D minus. It was my least favorite thing on the show, and it's it's a harsh grade, but it's because I I just don't really enjoy this sort of stuff. And by this sort of stuff, I don't mean silly stuff because I love the 24/7 thing that they're doing at the minute, and that's very very inherently silly. The problem I have with these sort of segments. Uh, in terms of like the tug of war with Strowman and Lashley is the lack of depth and direction. This just seems like they went, oh, they've had an arm wrestle, tug of war. They've had a match already, oh, we'll just do that in a certain order. And I, I just feel like there's honestly no real effort being put into a feud like this. And I do feel bad for both guys. And they're making the most of these segments, it's not their fault. I just find it a massive turn off as a viewer to my entertainment, my sports entertainment, if you will. Next up, AJ Styles is being interviewed and he is fired up for his match against Ricochet later on tonight, uh, but he's interrupted by No Way Jose and the club, uh, Gallows and Anderson, who are the good brothers, who are dancing around with No Way Jose, and AJ goes, lads, two sweet ski bros, but what are you doing? Remember when we used to run Japan? And then they were like, oh yeah, I remember. And he was like, well, not anymore. You basically suck now, is what he said. They got really angry and fired up. They went out raring to go to prove themselves, to prove to AJ that he was wrong. And that's kind of AJ's tactic. You know, he's trying to drag his boys up by putting them down, you know, trying to quest make them question what they're doing recently. And it, it nearly worked, but then they lost in about three or four minutes to the Viking experience, the Viking Raiders. This gets, you know what, this gets a B minus actually. There's a story for Gallows and Anderson. There's something for AJ to do as well. And it gives a bit of intrigue to the whole, is is AJ going to turn heel again because normally when he hangs out with those boys they're a bad influence on him and also the match was decent even though it was only three or four minutes long as well and it gets a win for the Viking experience so B minus no complaints I thought it was a sensible little segment right I'm going to need to use my notes for this one forgive me but a lot of stuff went down so we have more 24 7 based shenanigans uh well basically right Adam Pachitti is going to be really annoyed when he sees this basically we had a scheduled match that was interrupted by our truth running around with the belt and that match was Heath Slater versus Mojo Rawley. What a match that would have bloody been. Instead, R-Truth hit the ring, chased by a crowd of guys. He got in the ring, they were all chasing him. Heath Slater hit a neckbreaker and became the new 24-7 champion, but then R-Truth was able to win it back. Then, R-Truth was pinned by Cedric Alexander, who had the big lumbar check and became the new 24-7 champion. Then he was pinned on the outside by EC3, who got a huge pop for winning the 24-7 title. Then, as he was celebrating on the ramp, and it looked like he was going to end the segment on top, Carmella came down the ramp, snatched the title from him, and while EC3 turned around distracted, he was rolled up by R-Truth, and Truth and Carmella got out of there, and commentary screamed about how R-Truth is a nine-time 24-7 champion. Such a legacy. A su oh, such a man. I can't wait to do that video, by the way. I don't know how long down the line, but we have to do a rank, like every 24-7 title holder rank from worst to best. And the moment, obviously, the far and away winner is our truth. I'll give this a B. I was going to give it a B plus, but I've taken away a little grade because Mojo didn't wrestle. And he looked like a bit of a chump in the segment and didn't even get a chance to win the title. I'm sorry, Adam. That, that little downgrade is for you. Next up, we had Kofi Kingston uh, versus Sami Zayn, but it was prefaced by a bit of a war of words, an impromptu version of the Sami and KO show. Uh, Kofi was being interviewed in the ring, the heels cut him off, and they basically just had a bit of a bit of a to and fro, to back and forth. The heels point was, we beat up your friends last night on stomping grounds. Kofi was like, our bond is stronger than that. It doesn't matter. You guys are crap. Uh, and also, I've beaten both Owens and Ziggler now by myself, so I don't even have to worry that they're not around. I'm good enough anyway. I'm a fighting champion. And he proved that he is good. Way better than Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, dispatching them in a matter of minutes each. Uh, first of all, he had a little match against Sami Zayn and won, reversing the blue thunder bomb into a roll-up or like a pinning predicament. Then Kevin Owens got on the mic and said, right, I challenge you to a match now immediately. Let's get ready to go. And then we had a commercial break because this was one of those instances where there was a wrestling-based segment in a commercial break that wasn't allowed to have wrestling in it. It's so weird. It's so weird. This match lasted only about a minute or so because Kofi hit the SOS on Kevin Owens on the ramp and then beat him back into the ring. You know, he beat the count out and Owens was counted out on the outside. Didn't even get close to getting back in the ring. I wonder if it was actually that he was really shaken up or not. Commentary was the reason that I think that because they were so, so like taken aback, just kind of mildly like shocked by this. They were like, oh, Kofi got back in the ring. I guess he's, I guess he's won the match then. Kofi celebrated on the ramp with his title and was then beaten down by Samoa Joe. Yes, Joe. When Joe lost the US title at Stomping Grounds, I was hoping that he'd progress up to the main event scene. And it looks like he has. And if I can think of anyone better than Joe to be number one contender for Kofi's title, it'll be a struggle. Because he is one of the absolute front runners in my mind. And I'm delighted he's been put in that position. But I believe that kind of surprise attack by Joe at the end made this segment seem better than it was on the whole. And that's why it only gets a C plus grade. The 
The main reason that I'm so annoyed is because KO and Sami Zayn are coming off a big victory at Stomping Grounds, a great match, my personal favourite match of the night, I think, and... Sadly, they've been made to look like absolute chumps again, both losing to Kofi consecutively in just a matter of minutes, and all the kind of service, this whole weird commercial rule that Vince wants to enforce now. Next up, Alexa Bliss versus Naomi, but backstage earlier on in the night, Naomi and Natalia tried to convince Nikki Cross that Alexa was manipulating her, but Alexa caught it happening and she was like, no I'm not, let's have a match Naomi, or Naomi challenged her one way around or the other, it led to this singles match. This was another very short match though, as uh, Naomi accidentally hit Nikki Cross during the match with a baseball slide under the bottom rope. Then, as she was kind of half apologizing, half distracted, Alexa took full advantage, waited for her to get back in the ring, bang, DDT, and Alexa picked up a shockingly quick victory. Alexa then tried to do a bit of a beat down on Naomi, Nikki reluctantly joined in, and Natalia ran out to make the save, and holla holla, player player, it's time for a, well, for a commercial break, and then a Teddy Long special, a bloody impromptu tag team match. Get in. Unfortunately, there's not much to report on the match itself. It was okay. It was absolutely fine. Uh, this hole gets a C grade, and Nikki Cross hit the purge. It looked like she was going to get the win, but then Alexa Bliss stole the pin for Boo. And finally, the main event, Ricochet versus AJ Styles in non-title action, because of course Ricochet has just won the United States Championship. This match started off quite well, pretty slick exchanges from both, and then Gallows and Anderson came out, and AJ was like, okay. They got to ringside, and then one of them tripped Ricochet as he ran towards the ropes, and then AJ got on the mic and went, right, until you guys leave, we're not resuming this match. And I was like, oh, it's another commercial break, it's another one of these weird things, it's another one. Another one. DJ McMahon. But to their credit, once Gallows and Anderson had left the building, AJ and Ricochet put on a good match. It wasn't like blow away, takeover quality, or even really pay-per-view quality, but it was a very good TV match. And somewhat controversially, AJ Styles picked up the victory over Ricochet during his first match as the new United States champion, evading the 630 splash and hitting the phenomenal forearm for the big victory. And this should, in theory, lead to a title shot down the line, and I'm looking forward to that very, very much. This gets a B plus grade, but it should have been higher. Two things hold it back for me. One, the slightly ropey decision to have Ricochet lose his first match after winning the belt, but I guess you could say he was tired from stomping rounds. And the second thing is the whole weird opening with Gallows and Anderson, like it didn't need to be there. They'd already had a bit of their storyline play out earlier in the night. It's, it, it is what it is, but I hope they, I hope they drop it soon, this weird, this weird commercial decision. I don't understand at all, really. Overall, I'm going to give this Raw a B- minus grade. Uh, it wasn't a particular leap in quality from last week, but it was a leap in how important the show felt. It felt like a lot of big things were happening. For example, of course, The Undertaker appearing. Uh, AJ Styles versus Ricochet felt like a big match. Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins and stuff, I wasn't a fan of it, but whether or not you're a fan of it, you have to admit that it does feel like a big, important shift in the landscape of WWE's main roster right now. But the biggest thing holding the show back, I don't think it was like match quality or the writing or anything that usually holds the Raw back from achieving like a B plus or an A minus or whatever. This time it was this weird structure that I've mentioned. So, so far this Raw, I mean, uh, that I can count off the top of my head, or off my notes. Uh, we had an unorthodox tag team elimination match, which was a fun match, but clearly an excuse to do this whole weird commercial break thing. We had Sammy and Kevin Owens losing in quick succession to Kofi Kingston for the same reason, so there was a break between the match for the commercial, which I think really harmed Sammy and Kevin. We had the old Teddy Long singles match into a tag team match, they do that all the time though. And we had AJ and Ricochet stop starting, which I think really harmed the match. You know, it did bring momentum to a halt for no reason, and it was very frustrating. So yes, a B- minus for all. I don't think it was that bad at all, really, but they need to drop this rule. It, it's becoming really contrived, and how many weeks can they go on thinking of new reasons before it becomes just blatantly obvious? It's already pretty obvious there. I've just named four of them, and I'm probably sure there was more that I missed. Thanks very much for watching, and let us know what you think in the comments section down below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter at Cultaholic, and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do, then please do check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic, where you can pledge. And don't forget, of course, most importantly of all, to hit subscribe and to join us.